10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong are top stories today. Apple is set to face a widening Chinese workplace ban on the iPhone, a sign of growing challenges for the company in its biggest foreign market and global production base. Pressure on U.S. equity futures intensify and the dollar rallies after a hot ISM report raises prospects of a Fed hike. And Texas declared its first power emergency since a deadly winter storm two years ago. The state's power grid gets tested again as temperatures soar. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. You're watching the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Shanali Basic in New York. Shanali, a one-two punch yesterday. It was hot ISM. Today, it is Apple woes coming out of China. A lot of punches for sure. It's the September slump, Danny, and we're looking at another day of a down day of the S&P 500. S&P futures looking down about three tenths of one percent this morning so far. We're looking at some cooling of yields, however, a bid in the bond market. Finally, we're looking at a 498 handle on the two year yield, a change of about two basis points lower. We were above five percent yesterday. Once again, the dollar still on its rally. We will talk about this a lot today because this is seriously the story of the week. This is where you're seeing the movement in Asian currencies, very, very significant. You're seeing the onshore Chinese yuan really weaken to the high level since you've not seen since 2007. So pretty historic moves we're seeing in the dollar relative to other currencies around the world. I also want to do a check in on oil because you do have Brent crude hanging out still above 90. It's been there pretty much all week. It has been on a seven day tear, but you are seeing some softening of Brent crude down now about three tenths of one percent. So, Shanali, at the very top of the show, we got breaking euro area GDP numbers. I got to be honest, our excellent producers said to me, break them when they come. And I was kind of hesitant because they're just the final numbers. Usually there's nothing dramatic. But in these readings, we've actually had a big revision down year over year for the second quarter. The euro area economy grew a half of 1%. Previously, it was 0.6%. It looks even worse month over month. An almost flat growth, 0.1% quarter over quarter. The preliminary reading was 0.3%, the estimate. So, again, a story of European growth being worse than expected. Are we really going to get a hike next week amid that environment? The other big story that's moving European markets is Andrew Bailey testifying in front of Parliament yesterday, saying that we are near the end of the rate hike cycle. Is that another policy mistake communication error that we had? Him saying the same thing at the start of the year. Five-year yields react down six and a half basis points. We went from pricing a near certainty of a hike for the next BOE meeting to about 80 percent. Sterling, that also gets hit down two tenths of one percent versus the dollar. And finally, we are seeing a turnaround ever so slight in European stocks, basically flat, uh, just up 0.05 percent, Shanali. Now over, Danny, to the big story of the day. We have Apple falling in the pre-market, down about 2.5 percent as China seeks to expand a ban on the use of iPhones in sensitive departments to government-backed agencies and state companies. You see that sell-off uh, gaining some speed, now down 2.7 percent. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie to talk about what is going on. How much of a big deal is this, Tom? Uh, Shanali, so for the context, yesterday we had the Wall Street Journal reporting that some government agencies would be restricting the use of iPhones or at least asking their employees to leave those phones at home. Today, our own team at Bloomberg reporting on the fact that maybe China's state-owned enterprises are considering a similar set of restrictions as well. For the context, on some measures, China's government-backed entities, state-owned enterprises, employ 50-plus million people. So you're talking about the population of about Spain for the context. Now, we don't know if this is going to be applied across all of these businesses, if it's going to be limited. We haven't had an official audit yet, but it could be coming down the pipe. Obviously, hugely successful, uh, a significant for Apple that has, what, 20% of its revenue share comes from the Chinese market. And, of course, it still produces the majority uh, of its phones in that country. So has the star fallen for Apple is a question. Is it in the sights now of officials in Beijing who are security obsessed? Not unrelated, we had that excellent Bloomberg reporting from a few days ago that Huawei phones contain yeah. chips that seem to violate sanctions, specifically um, SK Hynix. They had a release today about investigating it. 
I mean, what did they say? I don't know how you kind of justify what looks like violating U.S. regulations. And this is a genuine question, isn't it? Why, why does it come down to report excellent reporting from Bloomberg for not just the White House to respond, but now SK Hynix yeah. to say, oh, hang on a second, yeah, where are, why are our chips <laughs> in these phones? Because, of course, the U.S. has imposed these restrictions and these sanctions. SK Hynix says that it, it complies with them, and therefore, as a result, it should not be seeing its own chips in these Huawei devices. Bloomberg did a teardown. It found these devices the only foreign component within the Huawei phone. It's possible that Huawei was stockpiling and they had a pile of these chips that they could go to. They've done that in the past to try and offset some of these restrictions from the US. That may be the playbook or these chips are getting in through another route. But yes, SK Hynix saying they are now taking a look at exactly how those chips uh, got into that Huawei phone. Right, and just affirming to Bloomberg, we are abiding by yes. the US government's uh, export re restrictions. Tom, thank you so much. Tom McKenzie there with the latest on tech abroad. Now, the Fed's beige book showed us that growth in the US and jobs slowed in July and August. This came after an ISM surprise that put the Fed rate hike back into play. Former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard spoke about whether another increase is in the future. It's probably wise from a risk management perspective and probably necessary based on the data that we've gotten that they keep that extra rate hike in there. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Valerie Titel. Valerie, the reaction was immediate. It was clear, stronger dollar concern that maybe they're not going to pause. Maybe they won't cut as much. Um, how much do we read into ISM versus some of the other signals that we've been getting? Because this is just one data point. Uh, it is just one data point, Danny, but that ISM figure was all around hot yesterday. The headline came in above expectations. And then the three subcomponents also, uh, the employment subcomponent, the prices paid subcomponent, and new orders all came in hot. That is why the market had such an impressive reaction uh, yesterday to the ISM print. Now, we do have to weigh it up with what we saw in the Beige Book. Now, the Beige Book did upgrade their assessment on growth to modest, which is an uptick, but it came along with some pretty healthy warnings about the U.S. consumer. And this is really front of mind uh, for the markets at the moment. How do we weigh these uh, these uh, early warnings we're getting on the U.S. consumer with the fact that we're still getting data coming in hot? And Danny, it is going to play out in the next Fed decision in two weeks time. Remember, we get their all famous dot plot, my favorite dot plot. A lot of attention is going to be on where the 2024 dot goes. Do these Fed officials revise their dot higher uh, in a signal to the markets that they do intend on keeping rates higher for longer. We're also seeing some movement in the front end of the curve after that ISM print. We're now pricing over a 60 percent chance that the Fed does go ahead and hike one more time by the November meeting. I'm glad you brought up the short end of the curve because you did see that pretty significant jump yesterday, but you are seeing that retreat a little bit today. There is still some volatility in the market now. How much are expectations changing heading into next year as this data keeps coming in so hot? Uh, look, uh, Sonali, we, we have had the data this week, yes, but uh, going forward, it's going to be about the final Fed speak that we get tonight. We hear from New York Fed, Fed President John Williams, who is speaking to Bloomberg. Now, this is important because last time he spoke, he talked openly about the fact that rates may be lower next year. The market is going to be very interested if he continues to keep that line, or does he shy away from talking about rate cuts, possibly signaling that he does uh, maybe amend his comment from a month ago and does believe that rates have to stay higher for longer and maybe his 2024 dot will shift up in two more in two weeks time our thanks to bloomberg's valerie titel now texas has declared its first power emergency in two years as soaring temperatures almost led to rolling blackouts with consumers curbing power usage now joining us now is eddie vanderwalt of bloomberg markets live you saw a very significant change in uh, power pricing on the heels of these uh, concerns these blackout concerns how much of an issue is this for the power market yeah absolutely look it went straight from 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 you know from from no warning to a level two warning they jumped over that level one and that's because you know um, shrinking supplies have, have pushed their grid to critical levels and they've been warning people to uh, turn you know stop charging their teslas and and you know turn off the air conditioning and other things that you know i i think i think Really, though, this is this is worrying because what we're seeing here on a micro scale in Texas is something that that we're going to talk about on a global scale. 
if you rely more on wind power and you rely more on, on sunshine for your grid, and at the same time you increase demand so much that you know uh, we, we're shifting our whole vehicle fleet to electric to electrification, then you're gonna you're gonna struggle, right? You're gonna struggle to keep up unless you invest heavily in utilities. And at the moment, you know, few people around the world are doing that. I mean, it happened here, didn't it? Was that last year? I actually can't even remember a time when we didn't have wind in the UK and then power prices went crazy. Yeah. Um, okay, the next obvious thing that comes out, because of course we got to make it macro, is inflationary pressures. Already gasoline is moving higher in the US. Does that compound that? Or is it just, okay, this is a very specific market in Texas. It does not feed into the American inflationary picture. The problem is that, yes, it's very specific to Texas. Um, but, but, if you see volatility in power prices across the board, then hedging power prices becomes more expensive mm -hmm. everywhere, right? And that means that whether, whether this is happening in Texas or whether it's happening in New York or whether it's happening in London, and all of these places are to some extent prone as we move forward, you, you've, got to, you've got to hedge in higher power prices longer term. And that means that it feeds through into actual prices, right? So I think this, this is a problem. But I also think that power companies are going to have to invest a lot more in utilities. That means they're going to have to charge customers now more for future dem for, 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 for current demand to in, in order to supply their future needs mm. and I think for that reason I think it's a good, very good point Danny I think this does potentially feed through into inflation yeah we're gonna uh, be having that uh, EV conversation later in the show Eddie thank you so much for joining us Eddie Vandervault there with the latest now coming up China's commodities imports pick back up as export slumps ease we're gonna take a deeper look on the China economy next and it is a close call for next week's ECB decision. That's the view from RBC Blue Bay's Mark Dowding. While the market has decided it's a sure thing, it's a pause. We're going to discuss that debate later this hour. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Shanali Basic is in New York. China's trade slump eased in August. It adds to early signals that the worst may be over for some parts of the world's second largest economy. It is in this moment where it's trying to regain momentum. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Shenzhen Bureau Chief Alan Wan. Alan, so we got this trade data. Does it tell us enough in terms of stabilization, are we there yet with China's economy? Well, I don't, I don't think we're out of the woods, but it, it's, it's really uh, whether or not you think like uh, the glass is half full or half empty. But a, a lot of people are looking at the, the data quite posit, positive, po positively. Uh, exports, even though exports fell for four straight month, uh, the pace of declines uh, has actually narrowed quite a bit. Uh, it was much better than expected, and also a big uh, improvement from the previous month. And we saw the same thing in, in imports. And the reason why you might think that uh, the Chinese economy may, may be improving as well is that you know, this, this, this comes after last week's uh, PMI data, which, which also showed an improvement uh, for, for, uh, for, for, for manufacturing. Uh, most notably, in, in this latest data, we also uh, saw that uh, Chinese exports to the U.S., the pace of declines have also moderated as well. And in South Korea, which is often a bellwether for global trade, we're seeing the same kind of moderation in terms of declines uh, for, for, for exports. Uh, so I think that overall things are improving. Whether you look at the actual exports themselves and then pair that with what's happening with the currency, how much of an issue is the currency movement and what factors will the trade improvement really hinge on at the end? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think with well, exports, it's a little trickier, right, just because a, a lot of economists uh, have a fairly, um, you know, pop, uh, uh, neutral or negative outlook for global trade this year. But in terms of imports, there's a lot of potential there. I mean, a lot of people see a rebound in domestic demand, especially now that the Chinese government has launched a lot of measures to support the, the property market. That said, though, uh, I, you know, you talk about the currency, the, the onshore yuan uh, fell to a 16-year low against the dollar today. Uh, and we know that a weaker yen will inevitably lead to more uh, expensive imports. So that's definitely something that could undermine the, uh, the picture for imports. And, and Alan, if, 
Yeah, fair enough. Alan, if, if this iPhone ban goes further, and, and let's say it, it goes far enough maybe to, to spook some of the development of iPhone equipment, Foxconn's the world, that sort of thing, out of China, how big of an impact would that have on the economy? Because presumably there's got to be some part of that calculus in China's moves to tell government officials and those at state-backed companies to not be using iPhones. Yeah, I, I mean... Um... One thing is the move, right? You, you, you know that Apple is a big uh, employer in China, and Apple, uh, you know, sells t tons of their phones in China as well. Uh, and and that, that's one part of it. The other part is that w what kind of signal does it send to foreign investors? Uh, that you know, we keep hearing the government is is, uh, uh, is opening the economy to foreign investors. Uh, don't don't worry about uh, all these recent actions. But uh, f from the looks of it, it just seems that um, it's more of the same. China. Under, maybe under the guise of national security, is is uh, you know, taking measures that uh, look like it's becoming much more, um, you know, maybe, maybe isolated from the rest of the world. Taking measures that maybe, for its part, it believes in, in it needs to do so for national security, but it's going to continue to spook foreign investors who are hoping that you know, um, especially China's relationship with Apple continues to uh, stay afloat despite you know increasing uh, U.S.-China tensions. Bloomberg's Alan Wan, we thank you for your reporting from Shanghai. Now from China to India, ahead of the G20 summit, Bloomberg's Minaka Doshi reports on the country's economic transformation. India is the world's second largest phone market. Over 200 million sold last year. A decade ago, most of them were imported. Now the country is a net exporter, with Samsung and Apple leading the charge. Prime Minister Narendra Modi wants to repeat this phone success across electronic goods, electric vehicles, green energy, chemicals, textiles. The near-term goal is to reverse the declining share of manufacturing in GDP, targeting $1 trillion in goods exports, and most importantly, creating jobs for the largest working age population in the world. But standing in the way of this manufacturing ambition are some old challenges, land acquisition problems, high logistics costs, and some new ones as well. Automation, lack of skilled labor. Take phones, for instance. The government has implemented a mix of high import tariffs on finished phones and production incentives to boost local manufacture. But supply chain indigenization is a long way off. According to one report, Indian factories add 18% in value to the electronic devices they assemble for export, compared with 38% in China and 24% in Vietnam. Manufacturing in Vietnam is also cheaper by at least a tenth. The Make in India campaign will benefit from record investments in infrastructure and logistics. There's also the lure of a potentially large domestic market. And now there's the China plus one wave as large global corporations seek to mitigate geopolitical risks and a slowing China economy by diversifying their supply chains. Since the liberalization of its economy in the 90s, India has come to be known as the back office to the world. But to become a developed economy, the government also needs it to become the factory to the world. Bloomberg's Menaka Doshi there reporting from Mumbai. Coming up, bidders, including Boaz Weinstein, are said to be revising their offer for Sculptor Capital. We'll have more on that Bloomberg scoop next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Shanali Basic in New York with Danny Berger over in London. Now some of the top stories we we're watching this morning include bidders, including Boaz Weinstein, offering to buy Sculpture Capital, are said to be revising their offer and addressing some of the concerns flagged by the board. That's according to a Bloomberg scoop. Weinstein's bid remains the same, but he's beefed up his equity commitments and eliminated risks related to debt financing. And Soho House is expanding in America. The Private Members Club is planning to open six more locations in the U.S., including in Portland, Charleston, to have 20 houses in the country by 2025.
Speaking to Bloomberg, CEO Andrew Carney highlighted post-COVID opportunities as Americans move out of large cities. Shelly, I don't know what it's like there in New York right now, but I swear you can't throw a stone without hitting a Soho house or a Soho house member in London right now. Now remember, they also have ownership over the NED too, which is also open in New York City and is pairing yeah. up with Michael Milken to open a location in Washington. Uh, now, will all of these locations be successful? Certainly, the backing from other billionaires certainly helps. Now, I say this as someone who was born and raised in D.C. If you're trying to remain a cool artist, kind of, I don't know, interesting <laughs> alternative kind of company, D.C.? I don't know, Shanali. I don't know. It, I mean, again, I am really lame and I come from D.C., so make of that what you will. Uh, you know, I'm from around the area, too, so it is interesting to see these pop up like little diamonds all over the place. But, yes. you know, uh, speaking of how it's trading, the investor perspective, this is a, still a stock, Danny, that is trading almost half of its IPO price since 2021. And it's doubled yeah. this year, but it is still a long way to go from where it started. And look, you know this probably better than anyone at, at Bloomberg, Shanali, the, the real estate woes that have been gripping the U.S. So much of Soho House is tied to that. I mean, they are working at some really expensive properties. The Ned, for example, in the U.S., all of that. I mean, a lot is at risk here if some of that property starts to downturn. A lot of leverage at stake. I'll speak from personal experience. They've been throwing some massive parties <laughs> in New York City. <laughs> All right, coming up, we're going to be speaking to Mark Dowding, CIO of Blue Bay Asset Management next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and here is what you need to know. Apple is said to be facing a widening Chinese workplace ban on the iPhone, a sign of growing challenges for the company in its biggest foreign market and global production base. Meanwhile, pressure on U.S. equity future intensifies and the dollar rallies after a hot ISM report raises prospects of a Fed hike. And then in Texas, it declared its first power emergency since a deadly winter storm two years ago. The state's power grid gets tested again as temperatures soar. I'm Shanali Basik in New York with Danny Berger over in London. Danny, what's the European market doing today? Look, we are still trading at least in UK assets based off of some comments from Andrew Bailey, the BOE governor yesterday. He talked about this idea of, of maybe we have hit the top in the cycle, that we are there. Dangerous comments considering in January he had said that they turned a corner in inflation and uh, we know what's happened since then. But that is how the market is trading. Five-year yields in the UK, gilts down by about nine basis points. Sterling, that continues to drop like a rock. We're now at 124. That's down weaker by two tenths of one percent versus the dollar. Some of the rate hike bets for September are paired back to with those dovish comments. They were above 90. Now they're around 80 percent that we're going to get a 25 basis point hike. Equities, though, picking up a little bit of steam here in Europe. Europe stock 600 up a quarter of a percent. A solid turnaround, though, from the start of the morning. We're we were trading lower, Shanali. How's the U.S. looking? Not as good. So you're looking at the S&P future still down another day. It is just not catching a bid yet, Danny. Sad September. But we are catching a bid, however, in the bond market. I've been watching that two-year yield all morning, and you are looking at it hanging around around 498. Now, listen, that is about three basis points lower in terms of its change from yesterday. Again, a bit volatile this morning, but we are uh, back in the bond market. We are also looking at the dollar. This is the big story. We are watching the really uh, velocity here in the U.S. dollar and the rate of change against foreign currencies. We will talk a lot more about that in this coming block and Brent crude now back below 90 we are looking at an 89 handle very close to 90 still though it is down on the day now seven tenths of one percent now we are also going to talk more about that dollar index like I promised it's on track for an eighth consecutive week of gains putting it on track for a historic run and that's according to data going back to 2005 now Asian currencies weaker the onshore yuan weakened to a 16 year low that's the weakest level since 2007 against the dollar the PBOC's will is tested and traders are watching the PBOC closely for fixing on where it will draw the line the daily reference rate was set at a stronger than expected level for a 54th 
straight day on Thursday. That is the longest streak since Bloomberg began its survey in 2018. Now to talk more about this is Mark Dowding, perfect voice for this conversation, CIO of RBC Blue Bay Asset Management. Mark, when you look at that surge in the dollar, when you look at the weaknesses in Asian currencies, what are you most uh, concerned about given where positioning is in the market right now? So I think a lot of the move that we're seeing here on the dollar has been very much supported by the, the, the fundamental backdrop. We're, we're seeing a, a, certainly a return over the last couple of months of uh, U.S. exceptionalism. Uh, and just as the U.S. economy continues to plow forward pretty strongly, um, I'd note that the Atlanta Fed now cast for, for Q3 uh, uh, growth estimates is running north of 5% in the, in the current quarter. So you're still looking at really pretty robust U.S. Uh, activity at a time when uh, activity elsewhere in the global economy is slipping. And, and certainly that's been the case in Europe. Uh, it's also very much the case in China as well. So we can see that these trends uh, have been justified. I guess my only concern here would just be the fact that uh, um, uh, this is uh, becoming a, a bit of a consensual view now. People have been sort of jumping on the long dollar trend. Uh, and, and obviously, when uh, investors all get the, uh, the same way on a, a trade, then uh, maybe it's start, time to start booking a, a few profits, perhaps. Right. When you have crowded trades, there's always that risk of a bubble. But And you have the dollar defying gravity. You have oil prices on the rise. What is the risk that that soft landing narrative really faces some pressure? So in terms of the, the the soft landing, at the moment, I'd say that in the U.S. you're not seeing a landing at all, are you? I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't think we can really talk about a soft landing at the moment because we don't really see growth slowing down ever so much. The other thing that I'd also point to as being a bit of a risk here is, is the trajectory on inflation. Um, I, I think we've done the easy part of the journey, bringing inflation down from 8% to sort of 4% sort of levels. But we're now going to be entering into the more difficult sort of last mile, trying to get inflation all the way back to central bank targets at 2%. That's going to be a more challenging stretch. And actually, in the near term, the fact that we've actually seen um, uh, oil prices moving higher, we've seen commodity prices more broadly moving higher, means that when we actually model uh, forecasts for inflation over the next couple of months, we actually see inflation um, sort of not really... Uh, uh, sort of joining the party and moving much lower. Mm. Uh, and indeed, sort of um, having spent time in, uh, in Europe this week, uh, there is clearly a, a bit of a sense looking at European data that over the course of the coming six months, we're going to be seeing weaker growth outcomes, but we're not going to be seeing much progress when it comes to inflation. And then uh, the Richemont chair also complaining that inflation in Europe means no one wants to buy Cartier watches anymore, Mark. It's, it's, it's a sad time. Um, look, all of what you're saying feeds back in to the strong dollar narrative. If you think it's starting to get crowded and perhaps things turn, where are you willing to stick your neck out and take the other side of a dollar cross? Is there a pair you like to short the dollar? So, so not not so much at the moment. Uh, I, I think the the, uh, the currency that really stands out to me is fundamentally cheap is the Japanese yen. Um, uh, Travelling to uh, um, uh, Japan recently, uh, you're struck by how cheap it is. By contrast, you go to the US uh, and and it's remarkably expensive. Um, uh, I had a beer in a, a bar in DC. It sent me back sixteen bucks uh, when you allow for a, a service charge, and that was just for a, a regular tin of beer. Um, uh, by contrast, Japan used to be the most expensive place to travel on the planet. It's now one of the cheaper places to go. So we do think that the, um, the yen is interesting, but you really need to see um, uh, more than comments from the Ministry of Finance uh, sort of uh, complaining against yen weakness. You actually need to see the Bank of Japan come to the party uh, and actually acknowledge that uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the goal in terms of... Uh, uh, delivering the end of uh, deflation has now been achieved uh, and we're now going to be in a, a situation where yield curve control can come to an end. If that happens, I, I think sort of fair value for uh, uh, sort of uh, dollar yen is probably around the 120 mark. So there's a lot to play for there when the policy turns. But I think it's a bit too yeah. early yet. Uh, at the moment, uh, for me, the narrative is uh, starting to reduce some of the dollar longs that we have. Uh, but I haven't really tried so, to flip the position and go the other way just because the data still looks pretty uh, pretty much in your favor for the time being. I got you there. So, so two questions off the back of that. First of all, 
I need to know what your Izakaya order is, Mark. Second of all, does that mean that you've started to also reduce your max short JGB position, if we're not there yet in terms of abandoning yield curve control? No, so we, we continue to like the idea of uh, being max short in JGBs. Uh, to, to me, if you look at uh, core inflation in Japan, you're looking at inflation running at 4%. Uh, we, 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 we think that uh, at the October BOJ meeting, the next big quarterly meeting they have, they're going to be revising up their inflation forecast once again. Uh, and actually, it's well possible in our eyes that they actually, the Kishida government actually says, uh, we've achieved the target um, of, of uh, bringing sort of uh, uh, inflation sustainably to 2% now. And that's actually the pretext for an end to YCC altogether at that particular meeting. Were you to see that, we, we, we'd expect to see 10-year JGB yields uh, go north of 1%. Uh, and so actually being really short JGBs is probably the one uh, sort of standout rates trade here that makes uh, a lot of sense in our eyes. In particular, uh, being short of JGBs, it doesn't cost you a lot in carry. So you can actually afford to be a bit patient uh, and, and sort of keep that trade on. Uh, with the yen, uh, clearly it's more difficult. You're paying a lot of carry if you want to be long yen here. Uh, and so you kind of need to wait almost to the moment that the, um, the policy does flip before you actually want to put that position on. But I, I certainly think that Japan is interesting at the moment. Uh, in the here and now, I think that when it comes to US rates, Euro rates, it is a bit of a, a muddied water situation. It's a bit premature to be really jumping in and wanting to go long anywhere else. The one thing that really stands out as a, a good risk reward trade continues mm -hmm. to be a short in JGBs. You think about the hedge funds that are short the dollar and you think about the way that hedge funds are trading treasuries just alone, Mark. And I'm curious, the Financial Stability Board just a day ago had brought up, re-raised really concerns around basis trading. These can be quite levered. Do you share those concerns? So, so uh, we, we see, I mean, levered basis trades here, but I don't think that this is really a, a big driver of concern around uh, market stability. Uh, I, I, I actually think that you're, you're seeing a lot of basis trading, partly because a, a lot of that macro community has struggled to make money in terms of directional trading in rates this year. Um, ostensibly, uh, you look at macro hedge fund uh, returns. Uh, I think the, the media manager is probably on a, a, a negative return, close to minus 5% on the year. Um, we, we, we're doing all right ourselves, uh, not having a spectacular year, but, but certainly a year which seems to be standing up much better than others. Um, but I think one thing that you would sort of say here in terms of the, uh, uh, the investment community quite broadly is that a lot of people came into 2023 uh, thinking the big trade was going to be buying treasuries being longer duration, it hasn't worked it, it, and it still doesn't work. Uh, and I, I'm a little bit cautious that there may be a, a capitulation at some point if we did say, for example, a, a negative inflation print cause investors to actually mm -hmm. give up on some of that long duration positioning in treasuries, I wouldn't right. be surprised to see another leg of a sell off maybe to uh, sort of 450 on tens as, a, mm -hmm. uh, as an area you might want to target more as a buy zone. Mark, we have to leave it there. We'd love to have you back soon. With all the currency volatility, we are seeing that it's Mark Downing of RBC Blue Bay Asset Management. Now, coming up next, we're going to talk about a big investment that KKR is making. We'll talk to Zenobi co-founder Nicholas Beatty on a $1 billion investment that included the big private equity firm. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Shanali Basic in New York. Now, UK power storage company Zenobi is set to draw more than $1 billion in fresh investment from investors. It's led by U.S. private equity giant KKR. So deal flow, it is still happening. Joining us now to discuss is co-founder Nicholas Beattie. Nicholas, thank you so much for coming on. Really great to see you this morning. Congratulations, new investment coming from KKR. Why? Why go to private equity here? And, and what's the hope with this new cash in hand? Well, um, as you will have seen from um, the stories about us, we've expanded since we established the business six years or so ago, very rapidly doubling our profits and our revenues over that period of time. 
Um, and we now we're a very cash hungry business and we need uh, a lot more equity so that we can continue to meet uh, the company's requirements and build out the new um, different projects that we have already established both in the network infrastructure side and on the fleet side. So this capital will be used to help us do the projects here in the UK but also help us expand in Australia and New Zealand where we have a presence and also into um, North America where again with the assistance of KKR who obviously has a very strong connection in that market um, we will be working with our established um, customers to help them electrify fleets and also mm. put in network infrastructure batteries. Now, now for, for a lot of green businesses, a lot of infrastructure green businesses, we still have kind of the COVID hangover effect of, of things that are still too expensive. I know a lot of European wind turbine companies, for example, still have parts that are delayed coming in, too expensive. What for you is still too expensive? What for you and your business is still giving you a headache? Well, the first thing has been, you're right, COVID has been incredibly difficult. I mean, we established this business in 2017. That's when we started operating. And obviously through the first parts of the business's growth, we were finding it very difficult to find the right people. Um, I have to tell you, as a business now with 240 people, we have 22 different nationalities in it. We're very proud of that fact. Um, we've been through periods where it's been very difficult to get the right level of supply. So I'll give you an example, you're very aware of lithium carbonate prices last year went up quite substantially towards the end of the year um, and that had caused a, a huge sort of impact on the cost of the supply particularly of large batteries also the batteries that are going on the buses that we finance mm. and operate we've seen that um, come down now more recently into into this year and indeed I think our feeling is that there's quite a lot of um, the EV um, demand which is sort of com coming off hasn't gone as expected and so there's more availability of batteries and we're seeing the price associated with the batteries therefore drop so there's always these sort of shifts and balance the other one that you'll again be aware of is the um, semiconductor problems that we have right. with Taiwan if you're building a bus you have to put a semi, semi number of semiconductors on that vehicle a lot of our software goes onto those semiconductors to monitor things so we had quite a lot of problems with them and we're pleased to see that that seems to have been resolved mm. now. What are some other problems with electrification? You think about some of the biggest spenders and some of the biggest promises that have made, been made by governments around the world. And then you think about how bloated the government balance sheets are and some of the rollbacks and plans. Germany, for example, scaling back its target for a million charge points by 2030, for example. How much are local obstacles a problem? Well, it's, that's a very interesting question because, um, frankly, we see that the um, government putting money into, into the industry is a bit of a two-edged sword because, obviously, if there are, for instance, in this country, as there have been um, with the Zebra um, grants, if there are grants available, then the commercial runners of buses will stop making decisions until they see whether they might be able to get those grants. So then they do get the grants and then everything starts going again. But it does mean that you get this sort of stop-start effect because of government um, putting money into, into the sectors. Um, overall, I think that we see that the, the government money is very supportive because definitely, as an example, a bus costs twice as much an electric bus compared to a diesel equivalent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the operators need to be able to use that additional capital to reduce that. So, that over the through life costs it comes closer to the parity with diesel and we're very grateful for the support the government gives but we do see as we've done with solar um, that there's more opportunities now to allow the market to develop perhaps on a more commercial basis um, as you say the governments have got lots and lots of problems on their plates with where they want to put the capital that they have available to them and I think a lot of these markets are getting closer to the point where commercial decisions can mm -hmm. be made and right. where the um, opportunities to Speaking purely of, fund them from debt markets are there. Uh -huh. Speaking of commercial decisions, you think about the Inflation Reduction Act. How have you been able to take advantage of that in the United States? Well, I love to be sitting here and saying we're taking advantage of it today. Uh, we're just getting into that market. We've got seven people on the ground um, in, in the US. Um, on the bus side, our largest customer here in the UK is National Express and their new name, but um, they own 30 plus thousand school 
buses in Australia and were in, sorry, in the UK and were being taken into um, the North American market yeah. by them. So that's really positive. Yeah. And equally, on the um, large battery side, we're also seeing opportunities to build uh, projects there. Again, that will be supported by tax credits and things that are coming out of the IRA. So we're excited about that. Um, and we see that as a definite opportunity to boost our growth in North America. I, I, I wonder what you make of, of some of the backlash to, to some of the ULEZ expansion plans in the UK, because it, it feels like it's kind of taken on a life of its own. Are you concerned that that grows into something that potentially dents the uptake of EV vehicles and EV adoption, for example, by governments for, for buses and things like that? No, I don't think so. Um, I think that, you know, what we're seeing is that people recognise that the amount of pollution that's produced by vehicles, particularly actually buses and commercial vehicles, is a very large part of the problem. So I think while there are these backlashes, there's still the recognition, there's still a regulatory and a legislative requirement to meet um, the Paris Accord and various other accords. And they're also seeing at the same time, you know, people, younger generations who are going to court to say, you know, Com company, uh, countries sorry, are not doing enough. Mm. Uh, it shouldn't just be the bare minimum. So I think there may be, there's a balance between the backlash and actually what needs to happen in the marketplace to, right. to remove these vehicles. I suppose sometimes lecture. backlash is just loud. <laughs> so it's what it happens. It's what it happens, exactly. Yeah. Nicholas, mm. thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time on. I'm sure it's a busy day for you. Nicholas Beattie, thanks so much for joining well. Zenobi, co-founder. All right, coming up, we're going to have a look at some of the market moving events to watch throughout the day, including an exclusive with New York Fed President John Williams. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Shanali Bastic is in New York. Now, a quick look at what's ahead today. Get you set up for your trading day. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau speaks with Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. That will be at 6.40 a.m. Eastern time after a hold from the Bank of Canada yesterday. Then we'll be getting U.S. initial jobless claims at 8.30. Then the FDIC releases its quarterly report on the U.S. banking system at 10.30. And then we're going to get a whole lot of Fed speak. That will include Harker, Goldsby, Bostic, Bowman, and Logan all on deck. But hey, this is the important one you don't want to miss. It is Bloomberg's panel with New York Fed President John Williams at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. He's a man who rarely speaks to media and is very influential in the Fed. And we'll be bringing you that live on TV and radio. Shanali. Danny, we're all looking at some stocks pre-market trading in the United States because Apple is taking another leg lower. Remember, China is looking to extend a ban across state firms and agencies when it comes to the iPhone. This is in addition to a Wall Street Journal report yesterday that said that several agencies began instructing staff not to bring iPhones to work. Bloomberg now reporting that they are looking to extend that ban. Apple now down about 2.7%. Now, Apple suppliers are also sliding on the report of this ban as well. This is a host of companies from South Korea, Japan, and uh, Taiwan suppliers all f trading lower on the news. Yeah, and, and you got to remember, I mean, again, this is extending beyond just government employees, but state-backed companies as well. That's a, a large chunk, Shanali, of the Chinese population. Mm -hmm. We have to keep that in mind and just how impactful this will be. Now, there's another stock I want to focus on. It's Tesla. Now, listen, Tesla is taking a leg lower this morning, 1.5% nearly. This is a stock that has doubled, so no one's crying for Tesla. But they did clarify during investor meetings in Munich that both production and deliveries will be down in the third quarter due to planned factory shutdowns globally. Deutsche Bank analyst Emmanuel Rosner wrote in a report. Uh, Danny, that does it for us for early edition before the U.S. market opens. Surveillance, Bloomberg Surveillance is up ahead. We'll hear from Tony Dyer of Canaccord, Genuity, and Seema Shah. This is Bloomberg.